Thanks so much, everybody. Uh, welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Kemler. Our next guest is the Oscar-winning actor from films like Whiplash, Spider-Man, Juno, The Front Runner, a bunch of really, really great stuff. Now you can see J.K. Simmons in the film, I'm Not Here, the story of an alcoholic at the end of his tether. Let's take a look. It's mom. Karen passed away this morning. I'm not here. You only get one life. Don't waste it. Take all the chances you can, it's all right. Everybody, hands together for the great J.K. Simmons. Let's hear it. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for coming back. Congratulations. This is an incredibly personal movie for you. You made this with, with your wife, right? How long had the two of you been taught? When did you first start talking about making this movie? Well, to clarify, my wife made this with me. Fair. She's, she's the writer-director. Uh, I'm, I'm just the hired hand. Uh, How many times did you audition? This has been, yeah, we had three callbacks, and it was, it was <laughs> grueling. Chem t chemistry test. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it was uh, it was a very lengthy process because uh, she and her writing partner really took their time uh, putting it together. Tony Cummings, her writing partner, my wife's name is Michelle Schumacher, by the way. Uh, they they wrote together and the, and uh, uh, they they write uh, sitting in front of their computers. Her in Los Angeles, him in New York, um, and then you know rewriting and rewriting and rewriting. And then when we uh, when we got into uh, production, of course, it was bang boom like indie films are. I think twenty days. And uh, my part of the film we shot in uh, in five days, um, and uh, and then she also does all of her own editing. So she put the film together, and and you know we were out to some festivals and things. And then she went, yeah, no, that's not the movie. And she totally re-edited the movie into after the, the, the version that, after some of the festivals, yeah. Wow. And then uh, and then it played at uh, Rain Dance and Camera Image uh, after that in the, in the version that. Uh, that we will see March 8th in a theater near us. There it is, March yeah. 8th. You did that for me, thank you. Uh, what is it like, I mean, I, I can't imagine, you. have you ever had an experience like that before where you saw what you thought was a finished product for an extended period of time and then it changed and there was, it was something different after, after which I'm assuming changed your performance a little bit as well. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, it did. And, and uh, no, I don't think I really have. I mean, I've been a part of uh, uh, just really the last few years, uh, Sometimes been able to be a part of seeing an early cut of the film and and uh, and having a little input, uh, you know, uh, at least allegedly, um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, and then seeing the final cut. Uh, but but this was yeah, seeing two different final cuts was uh, was a unique experience for me. Yeah. How uh, you you know you reference uh, being able to be in the edit editing room just a little bit and have some say, a minor amount of say, as, as you said. What was it like for you to sort of start dipping your toe in that? And were you ever nervous or hesitant about how much you would say or how much you wouldn't say? Because so often I think people on screen are misunderstood to be thinking about consistently, like, can we have more of my face in there, which they rarely are. Yeah. Usually thinking, like, cut, um, cut more of me. Yeah, no, I wasn't, I wasn't concerned about uh, uh, what I said because I knew it was going to be largely ignored. Anyway... <laughs> Um, really the first time a anybody like offered to uh, open up the editing room for me was uh, the lovely Sam Raimi wow. with the first Spider-Man movie. It was like, oh, come on in, you know, help me look at your scenes and, you know, see what you think works. Because we had really sort of, in, in the first two movies especially uh, with Sam, we'd really sort of manufactured a lot of that on the day, which is uncharacteristic for those kind of giant budget movies Wait, where well, there was really a lot you of improv going that on. on the no, day. no, there was a lot of, uh, I mean, he allowed an extraordinary amount of input uh, from from really some relatively unknown actors at the time. Um, so Can't yeah, get away was, with that was, on a superhero movie was, these days, I feel yeah, like. Yeah, oh, well. <laughs> we did. <laughs> did it feel like you had, uh, and I, I want to get back to I'm Not Here, of course, I don't want to go down Spider-Man memory lane too long, but did it feel like you had, because you've, you've been in other superhero movies in the more con time that we live in now, where they are, there's even more studio pressure, I feel like, on them. Did it feel like when you and Sam were making Spider-Man, you had maybe as many sort of heads looking over your shoulders as, as those movies do now? Uh no, it didn't. Uh, it felt like he was making. I mean, uh, although it did escalate a little bit, I think sure. between one and three, you know, that was, uh, you know, I mean, that's that's the way those movies are made now, and obviously, the you know, there's there's big bucks going on there, uh, as opposed to indie film land, uh, where uh, where really there's never uh, an an issue of uh, uh, 
you know, even in television, whether it's network or cable or, or whatever, you know, there's a, there's always a studio involved and there are always notes from them. And it's so great to, for Michelle to be able to uh, just make the movie she wants to make. And, and, and it's great as an actor to know on this or any film, you know, when the director is coming to give you a note, it's, it's a notes. note from the director. It's not like, oh, the studio thinks people aren't going to understand, you know, so let's make sure we make the movie for the dumb people who aren't really paying attention, you know, that's not what this movie is. No, uh, I mean, no specific examples, of course, but what is that like as an actor when you get a note that is, and the director's honest and says, look, this is not coming from me, it's coming from back here, and they want to make sure that people understand. How, yeah. how do you do that as an actor? Well, usually the director doesn't come out and say that because, <laughs> because the actor is miked. Um, but but you, you, sometimes you get, if the director's like, you know, a, a real collaborator with, with you, you know, you kind of get the, you know, the look as, as they're giving you the note. And, uh, you know, look, it's a, it's a collaborative process. And in the case of a big studio movie, yeah, the studio is part of the collaboration and, and hopefully, a, a, you know, a, a helpful part of that. Um, sometimes they, it, it does feel like a nuisance to, a, you know, a, a writer, director or an actor who's, you know, just trying to tell the story that, uh, that, that they think is the essence of the project. But that said, you know, actors can sometimes probably find the director of the project a nuisance when it comes to their performance at times as well. Everybody's part of the collaboration. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and the more people that are involved, you know, the more chefs you have stirring the soup, then, uh, you know, the, the more difficult it can be sometimes, which is, uh, yeah, again, one of the other nice uh, luxuries is not really the word to use for indie films, <laughs> I guess, but uh, one of the nice aspects of it is that, uh, um, you know, it's... The, the the collaborative circle is uh, is tight, and uh, and that much uh, uh, closer. Did you feel that you collaborated differently with your wife as a director than you would other directors, just out of closeness and proximity? Uh, well, there are there are directors I've worked with multiple times besides Michelle Schumacher. Um, you know, Sam Raimi, uh, Jason, Jason Reitman, uh, uh, Damien Chazelle. The, uh, you know. And, and that I've really d developed a, a level of trust with, but uh, certainly no one that I, that I trust as much as uh, Michelle Schumacher. Do you sort of all have, a, have a shorthand where you know exactly what she wants and where she's coming from, and also probably because she's been telling you about the script for a long time? Yeah, uh, although uh, I was <laughs> kind of surprised at myself a few times on set where, you know, we, we, we would do a take and, and she would come in and, and you know, uh, whisper something... Um, you know, soft and sexy in my ear, and I was like, "Honey, save that for later." Um, no, she, she would she would come in to to give me a you know a a, a note a, a specific. The whole crew was uh, like, "Oh God, yeah, God this stop!" Is really uncomfortable, yeah. and, and the dude's basically naked. So <laughs> the boom um, up is like, oh, yeah, geez. yeah. Um, uh, no, where she would she would give me a little a little uh, adjustment or a little insight, and and I would go, "Oh, I wow, yes, I." Had not thought of that, uh, you know, and I and I thought, you know, we'd been we'd been talking about it a lot going into it, uh, um, but uh, but you know, like any good director, she's, you know, she's seeing what's happening and what's unfolding, and something new occurs or or something that uh, that I you know simply hadn't thought of yet. Was there? You know, oftentimes when it comes to uh, when it comes to performance, actors like to pull things from their life, from their personal life. Was there's a lot of emotion in your performance in this? Did it help that you had someone there who knew intimate details about you and could pull stuff, could you know, whisper something in your ear or be like, "Remember this moment? Maybe we can think about that." Uh, yeah, not, not but needed. That, I mean, that was that was implicit. I, I, I don't, I don't think that was ever, you know, whispered into my ear on set, you know, or, or necessary because we both knew um, uh, not only the story that she'd written, but, the, you know, the, the different facets of her life and my life and our life together that, that were, you know, partially fictionalized into the story as well. So uh, that was intrinsic. And, and, and you know, uh, always is when, when there's good writing that I connect to, there's always an aspect of substitution, if you want to be uh, Uta Hagenish about it, um, where uh, not that not that you know you're in a scene in this movie thinking directly about something else in your life, but that all of that sort of and, and you know when you've been on the planet as long as I have, you you got a lot of life behind you to uh, to fuel um, whatever it is your character is going through. 
Yeah, and there is that thing, um, no matter how much something is fictionalized, I think even sometimes supernatural stories or crazy comic book movies, a writer is still putting in little intimate moments that are probably taken from somewhere in their life or somebody else's life. So something like this, as much as it'd be like, yeah, my dad wasn't like that, but that is a little bit of a story that I told about a friend's dad another time somewhere else. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, your performance is largely silent. Uh, did something like did doing something like that scare you? Doing a for the most part silent performance? Um, no, I mean there was a little bit of an aspect of it's interesting actually that my wife wrote a part for me that I don't talk. Shut up. Um, uh, there was uh, uh, you know a little bit of that uh, uh, it's feeling. One way to of, communicate it to you, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, what is the overall? Yeah. Um, you know, obviously, that's a that's a, a major tool for an actor is uh, you know your, your voice, your speech, um, and not really having the use of that uh, for for the most of this film was a little like the boxer tying one hand behind his back and and, and you know working on um, you know the other part of his game. So it it kind of uh, um, you know it was uh, even though I have been doing this for a while, you know, it was a learning experience and uh, uh, kind of a, almost like a training exercise in a way. You know, I think um, you're probably based off of Oz, but when your career really, people started really noticing you and talking about J.K. Simmons, you you were already kind of getting cast as like kind of tough guys or sort of like lived in men who've had lives behind them, weathered, some some would say, even though you don't look weathered, you look great. Uh, trying to pull myself out of this shithole I'm digging right now. <laughs> Dude, I was old when I started. Okay, there we go. And I looked old before I was old. But it's, I, I always wonder when an actor is cast as, like, consistently cast as a tough guy or, or an angry person or, like, you were cast in Oz, but you're still an actor. Like, what was your life bef- like, and what did it feel like to suddenly get, be getting cast as these, like, angry, tough guys and weathered old men? Well, Oz, uh, specifically, that because that was... Uh, the first thing that I got a significant amount of attention for after 20 years of theater, you know, um, and I was afraid of it. In fact, even though I was completely from hunger, I, I almost talked my way out of that job in my meeting with uh, Tom Fontana. God bless you, Tom Fontana. Thank you. Um, because I, I thought I, I, I can't spend my whole career on camera being a Nazi bastard. And, and if people going to see this show the way we think they are, uh, how am I going to not be typecast, you know? So we really talked about that a lot in the initial meeting and, 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 and my, uh, my hope. And it's really amazing that I, looking back, that I had the cojones to even, like, say anything other than, oh, thank you, you know, because... Tom had was, the patience to, like... Right, exactly, yeah. to go, this schmuck, really, you know? <laughs> um, but, uh, but, you know, to, to make every effort to, to make that character, you know, a well-rounded not well-rounded, <laughs> but a complex yeah. human being, you know, and not just, uh, you know, the cartoon bad guy. Um, even though people did refer to me when they would see me on the street as, oh, you play the bad guy on Oz. Like, and I would um, be like, yeah. dude, there's a lot of bad guys on Oz. I mean, the maximum security they prison. murder and yeah. rape and stuff, and that's bad. <laughs> but I'm the worst of the bad <laughs> yeah. guys. But did it feel weird to suddenly be getting cast quite often, even though you started old as sort of like weathered, tough guys? I mean, like you said, you were spending 20 years on the stage. That's not, you're not necessarily coming from like a Muay Thai fighting ring. <laughs> no, and I was, yeah, exactly. And I was playing Tommy Albright in Brigadoon, you know, on stage. And, and, you know, well, Captain Hook and Peter Pan, that was kind of a bad guy, which is where my wife and I met, actually. She, really? she was Tiger Lily, and I was Captain Hook in the uh, Broadway revival of Peter Pan with Kathy Rigby. Yeah. When was that? 1991. Wow. Yeah, she was a child. Um, it was barely legal. Um, and uh, yeah, and that was the beginning of it all. And is this the first time, forgive me for not knowing this, the first time that you guys have made a film together? No, no. Uh, uh, she's, she started making, uh, uh, after having babies and being a devoted mother for <laughs> a few years until they were off to school, still a devoted mother, uh, um, <laughs> When, she when, gave it up. When, she when, just gave it up to when, make movies. When she, uh, when she decided to go to the other side of the camera, you know, rather than continuing to pursue an acting career, uh, she made a bunch of, you know, little short films, some of which featured me and or our kids, um, who, by the way, are both uh, uh, involved to one extent or another in I'm Not Here. Our daughter you can be glimpsed very briefly uh, as, a, as a background actor. And she's the one who's decided now she wants to be an actor. Uh, which I guess was unavoidable given who her parents are. 
Uh, and our son contributed a lot of uh, sound design and, and some of the score, actually, uh, including the, uh, the end credits uh, music. That is so cool. Yeah. How does it feel, coll- all of you guys collaborating together? It's awesome. Yeah. It's the best. Her, her brother is, our, is the producer, Randall Schumacher. Um, yeah, it was, it was very much a family affair. That's incredible because all I remember me saying to my parents when I was a teenager or around the time was like, get away from me. Yeah. No, but your, your kids, you and your kids are all collaborating together. Yeah, well, yeah, and it, it's been beautiful. And, and, you know, I think we'll, uh, we'll continue, uh, you know, to some degree or another uh, off and on, you know, depending on the project, uh, you know, for the foreseeable future. Now, when you're uh, on set with your wife and you're and and you got and you guys are talking out a scene and figuring things out, do you feel like you have to approach that conversation differently in front of the crew? I always wonder about that because oftentimes when couples are working together, whether they've been together forever, the rest of the crew, because they have such a shorthand, can feel slightly outside of that. Uh, yeah, I mean, and and it is oftentimes a delicate issue. Uh, you know, whoever the 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 director is. Um, I tell you, in, in in this case, it was beautiful to to be playing this character who is so vulnerable and so naked. Literally, but, yeah. Only in, vulnerable in all senses naked. of the word. Yeah, um, you know, to be to be directed by uh, by the person that I love and 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 have one hundred percent trust in was uh, was invaluable. Um, uh, those those kinds of conversations, and and again, they were surprisingly few. Uh, 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 you know, on the day, kinds of conversations because because she had already prepared everything so well, and and obviously I was you know prepared as well and stepping into something that uh, that I uh, had a a good overall idea about. Which, by the way, collaborating, even though I don't really share scenes much, uh, Sebastian Stan uh, uh, and and Ian Armitage, you know, we all play the same character at three different times. Uh, in the in his life, and uh, and there was a, a great deal of collaboration beforehand about you know how to make this uh, uh, you know cohesive and and uh, um, believable as uh, as different ages of the same guy. Yeah, I loved how he was such a uh, he was a big talker at, in, in the movie, like early on Sebastian Stan's version of you, and we sort of see that slowly whittle away until he becomes this silent, lonely man that that we see you in the as in the present. Right, right, and that and that was the case from the you know the big the beginning uh, you know inception of it with with Michelle and Tony putting it down on paper and you know that sort of evolution and then and then Sebastian. Uh, brought to it what he brought to it and 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 really took well, I had the easy part really because I uh, my part of the story is obviously chronologically the last it was also the last week of shooting so I was informed by everything that Ian had done and that Sebastian had done before I stepped onto the set Are you looking at footage or anything to see what Yeah yeah I mean I was on set you know when I could be I was I was bouncing around on another film uh, uh, during the first couple of weeks but um uh uh, and yeah, and just uh, you know, hanging out with with them and with Michelle, obviously, and and uh, uh, talking about even not even specifically about the film or the character, but but just sort of whatever, soaking up each other's vibe. You know, you said uh, literally naked. You are literally naked for most of your moments in the movie. Is there anyone else you would have trusted to do scenes like that with? Yeah, I don't know. There's no one else. Well. Tom Fontana, I guess, because <laughs> you owe him one. Everybody had their naked turn on Oz, That's but uh, you know that was that was early on. Um, uh, I, I don't know. I, I don't know at this point. I, I think uh, maybe not. I think you know, in regards to Oz and Tom Fontana, you've. But I think both times I've interviewed you, you've said that, and somehow it's come up that the scariest thing that you've ever had to do on camera were the musical numbers <laughs> in Oz. Well, that, that he had, uh, after, I, I think it was our third or fourth season, for the first time ever, he had called me at home to ask me if it was okay if he write a certain thing for my character. And, he, and that was a message on the answering machine. And uh, by the way, that was a- another collaboration with Michelle and I, because she had a recurring part on Oz as well back back in the day. Um, uh, and I, I got this message from Tom saying, I just want to run this by you before I, you know. And I was like, what? I mean, he's had me, you know, murder people, rape people. He's had me crucify a guy. He's had somebody poop on my face. He, you know, Forgot what you the hell? Crucify the guy. He, and he never asked me about any of that. It was just like, you know, here, do this. 
So I was terrified as to what, and then, and then when we finally spoke, he said, I want you to sing. And I was like, phew, you know. Oh, so it was yeah, just no that, problem. that moment between the answer machine message and actually discuss, right. talking. That was when I was, I was trying to imagine how perverted whatever it was going to be. <laughs> you know, yeah. What is then, I, you know, I have to ask, what has been the scar your scariest moment on a set? Scariest. You can say. Uh, <laughs> well, I did get injured on the set of Oz, actually, in a, in a fight scene. And I think I was probably more scary, again, for Tom Fontana, who was the first face that I saw as I was coming out of uh, being unconscious, lying flat on my back on a gym floor with a geyser of blood coming out of my head. You know, No, the first face I saw was the set medic who was standing over me going, I swear to God, like completely freaked out at the sight of blood, and then and, and then one the of the aren't yeah, really like. yeah, one of the stuntmen stepped in and and was like one of the early Ultimate Fighters, so you know he was pretty used to blood, and then and then the next the next face was Fontana's going, you're okay, right? <laughs> went and got nine stitches and uh, then went back to work that afternoon. Nine stitches and then went back to work. Yeah, well, you can only shoot me from here. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, I mean, it was Oz. You had to be a hockey player, you know? You, you, there was no no weenies on that show. Uh, I think we have time for one uh, question, or I think we have two questions. Uh, who was a question? Who was one? Right there? Hey, JK, thanks so much for being here, man. I can't wait to see this flick. Uh, you've done a role for over 20 years that everyone may not know, the yellow M&M. And I want to ask, how did you get that gig, and what's been your experience playing such a rich chocolatey character. Yes. Well, it is uh, certainly the sweetest gig of my life. Um, that was, you know, I was just in the days when I, uh, I was uh, auditioning for voiceovers here and, and uh, kind of making the rounds and went into that audition and ridiculously enough, uh, I saw the little breakdown, the character breakdown that they do at most auditions, you know. Oh, the red M&M is this kind of guy and the yellow M&M is this kind of guy. And at the time, I was playing a kind of a fast talk in New York cop guy, so I, th I thought I was going to audition for the red M&M. When I was called into the room with uh, Janet Eisenberg, the casting director, she said, okay, so you're going to read Yellow. And I, I got into this, like, you know, oh, Marlon Brando thing. About, it, was, it was like, you know, the actor's studio talking about which character am I really, you know, going to... And I finally allowed her sort of condescendingly to talk me into, okay, fine, I'll read the Yellow M&M. And, uh, you know, yeah, 23 years later, where Billy West is the red M&M, and I'm still yellow. And do you guys ever record together? or is it you We do, not as often as we used to, but, uh, but yeah, still, we're both in L.A. now. So, yeah, we, 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 a lot of times we cross paths coming and going, but they do. I think they learn not to let us in the studio at the same time because we were, we were having a little too much fun. <laughs> yeah. Uh, JK, uh, congratulations on the film. Congratulations to your wife and, and, and your brother-in-law as well on the film, and really your whole family and the family affair. It's a it's a beautiful piece of work. Uh, it comes out Friday of next week, right? March, March 8th. 8th at theaters and video on demand, uh, same day. It's called I'm Not Here. Everybody give JK Simmons a huge round of applause. Let's hear it. <laughs>